All right, this is Daniel, Revelation for Beginners. We're on lesson four. If you're wondering where to open to in your Bibles, uh, I will be reading in a little while out of Daniel chapter seven. We'll throw up uh, the slides uh, on the board, but if you prefer reading out of your Bibles, just have it ready at Daniel chapter seven. Well, so far we've uh, reviewed the first uh, three sections of Daniel's book. Uh, broken down in the following way. First of all, his arrival at Nebuchadnezzar's court talked about his experience as a young man uh, being brought uh, out of his homeland into uh, the Babylonian Empire's uh, headquarters, if you wish, being trained uh, for life and service there, young Jewish man. Then the next section is uh, his interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you know, the statue, we talked about that last, uh, last time we uh, had our class. And then we talked about the four major events in Daniel's life that uh, are recorded in his book. Uh, and the four, of course, uh, events were the three young men in the fiery furnace, uh, the king's madness and recovery, uh, Belshazzar, uh, who was the, the next king, and the writing on the wall, warning him of the, en of the ending of his, uh, of his reign. And then, of course, a personal story of Daniel uh, in the lion's den. I'm not going to summarize those. We've already covered them. But th that was uh, you know, another section of the book where Daniel reviews four main events in his life over a long period of time. These things just didn't happen. You know, one week this happened, next week that happened. It over, it, it, these four events you know, took place over a, a period of, uh, of many, many years. Now in the final part of the book, Daniel is going to describe dreams and visions that he had concerning events that were mentioned in the original dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. That's a, this is a very important point. You have to remember that it's always about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. There are different visions, different images, but they're always about the same thing. And if we understand that, you know, we're well into understanding uh, sometimes the very strange uh, visions that he had. Now we remember in that dream, Daniel saw the overview of history for the next 600 years and beyond. Now the visions that he has will give more detail concerning the events that he foresaw in Nebuchadnezzar's original dream. After all, there are just so many things that the, the image of a statue can convey. You see what I'm saying? So the statue conveyed the four kingdoms that were you know, about to come, well, Babylonian kingdom, and then the Medo-Persian kingdom, and then the Greek, uh, the, you know, the kingdom of Greece, and then finally the Romans. And so the statue portrayed those. The visions are going to give details about each one of these kingdoms, okay? So it's always about the statue, it's always about the kingdoms, it's just that the visions kind of color in a lot of the details that he doesn't do at the very beginning. So the balance of Daniel's book has four visions concerning world powers, but also other visions of future events and an appearance of God's angels. Well, first of all, I want to give you an overview of the next six chapters. Then we're going to go into detail about the visions and their historical fulfillment. And I've given you a chart that looks like this. And uh, I want you to keep your eye on this chart because it kind of gets confusing when you go through all the visions and everything. You, you, know, you wonder where you're at. So if you keep the chart in front of you, it'll help you understand where we are in explaining. J very simply, chapter two, chapter seven at the top, right? Chapter eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then in chapter two, remember, uh, uh, the ba B stands for Babylonian, uh, MP, uh, Medo-Persian, Greek, Roman and then uh, KG is the kingdom of God. So in chapter two, his vision had elements of all of these things. In chapter seven, his vision has elements of all of these things. In chapter eight, his vision only speaks about two of these things, the Medo-Persian uh, kingdom and the kingdom of Greece. In chapter nine, it's a whole different thing. He talks about 
the 70 weeks, and we'll talk about that a little later on. In chapter 10, the angel uh, appears to him. In chapter 11, very interesting, it's not about Greece or Rome, it's about kingdoms and uh, local, you know, uh, uh, local battles uh, um, that took place in between the Greek and the Roman time. All right, and I'll, I'll explain that to you. And then in chapter 12, it's about the Roman kingdom and the kingdom of God. All right, so that's what the chart is and it'll help us to, to kind of follow that. So let's take a look in chapter two. So in chapter two you have the original dream, describing the future kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, the Greek, the Roman, and of course the kingdom of God, and these were represented by the statue, and we've already gone over that. In chapter seven, uh, the first vision that Daniel has, he sees the same kingdoms, but this time he sees them as beasts. So the lion that he sees represents Babylon. The bear that he sees represents Medo-Persia. The leopard represents Greece. The terrible beast that he sees represents Rome. And then of course the Lord and the saints, the kingdom of God. And I'm going to come back to these and give even more detail what the details represent, but now we're just going to do it quickly. Um, uh, chapter eight. Chapter eight uh, there's more information concerning the second and third kingdoms, especially their struggle for power. And so the Medo-Persian empire is represented as a two-horned ram, and the Greek empire shown as a swift he-goat with one great, uh, great horn. Uh, so Daniel describes the victory by the he-goat and his subsequent demise and replacements. Then in chapter nine, we have a prophecy more than a vision this time. In this chapter, Daniel recognizes that the captivity of the Jews, predicted to be for 70 years by Jeremiah, is now over. And so he prays and urges their return based on Jeremiah's prophecy. Remember, you know, Jeremiah prophesied that they would be carried away for 70 years if they didn't repent. And so Babylonians came in, they took them, they took them away captivity and Daniel was one of the ones taken into captivity and he had a long life in captivity because he was there as a young man. Now during his lifetime the 70 years has gone by and so he realizes wait a minute this prophecy is about to be fulfilled. When I say realizes I think you know, God is speaking to him, God is showing him. Nevertheless in real time that 70 years has gone by while he's been alive in Babylon and he realizes the time is over for this prophecy to be fulfilled. He also makes a prophecy about the future duration of the Jewish nation in terms of 70 weeks. And we're going to examine this from a historical perspective and we're going to look at Jewish numerology to try to understand the 70 weeks idea. But that's what chapter nine is about, the prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy concerning the Jews. In chapter 10, an angel appears to Daniel and prepares him for more visions to come. He also provides a certain insight into the struggle taking place in the spiritual dimension between God's angels and Satan's demons. You know, we don't have a lot of information about angels. I mean, there are a lot of mention of angels in the Bible, more than we realize, hundreds of you know, mentions of angels. But we, you know, we don't have a clear picture of what exactly they do and, and is there a hierarchy and what is, their, you know, what is their relationship to one another and what is their relationship to us and their relationship to God. And here in Daniel, we just get a little glimpse, just a tiny little glimpse of the work of angels. You know, they're, they're not just taking care of little children, you know what I'm saying? And so we see angels as uh, hmm, guardians, uh, that may be too strong a word, you know, but sentries, let's put it this way, for certain nations. And Daniel speaks of the battle, the, the war that goes on between uh, Satan's uh, demons and angels, even mentions them. So an interesting chapter, chapter 10. Chapter 11, uh, this chapter predicts events that will take place 
as I said, between the rise and the fall of the Greek and the Roman Empire. And so as the Greek Empire was descending and the Roman Empire was ascending, there was a certain activity that was taking place there. When the Greek Empire was in decline after Alexander the Great's death, his empire was divided among his four generals. One of these generals received control of Egypt and Palestine. Now this region was in great turmoil during this time as regional powers, and when I talk about regional powers I mean Syria to the north and Egypt to the south, they vied for control. They were always at war with one another and, and what they wanted to do was take over Palestine, Israel. They wanted to take over that land as a place where they could stage a war against each other. So the south wanted to take it over to wage war against the north, and the north wanted to take it over to make war against the south. Now you have to remember, these were powers, but they were regional powers. They were not world powers. Greece, that was a world power. Rome, that was a world power. Syria and Egypt, they were regional powers. And so what Daniel does is he makes a prophecy not about world powers, but about the regional powers and what was going on in between the rise and the fall of Greece and Rome. So these local wars took place before Rome took over and eventually seized control. So Daniel, as I mentioned, prophesizes concerning the outcome of these regional struggles centuries before they took place. I mean, what's more difficult for God? To, to make a prophecy about the future concerning great world powers? Or to make a prophecy about the future about small little kingdoms and their skirmishes? You know, if you know the future, you know the future. You know, you know all of it. Now the reason for the prophecy is that it concerned the people of God. It concerned the Israelites because the war between the north and the south was always fought over you know, the Jews and they had something to do with that and his prophecy talks about that. Okay, uh, chapter 12, uh, the final chapter, summarizes the conflict between the last great world power and the kingdom of God, which is the church. And Daniel correctly sees the victory of the saints after much persecution by this fourth kingdom, which is Rome. Now, our problem with these chapters is determining the exact time that Daniel is referring to. Um, some visions of prophecy can be taken literally or symbolically. They fit either way. We have to understand how prophecy works. Some prophecies have what's what are called primary or secondary or even what's called a final fulfillment. For example, um, the king's madness. Remember when he talked about the king's madness? When Daniel said to, the, to Nebuchadnezzar that if he didn't repent, right, he'd be like an animal for several years and he'd lose his power and so on and so forth. And what happened? Nebuchadnezzar didn't repent. He was struck with an illness, psychological illness, and he went around like an animal eating grass and for several years. Okay, well, was that a prophecy? Well, of course it was a prophecy. He prophesied that something would happen in the future. Was it very far in the future? No, it, just a few years actually in the future. So that was what's called a primary prophecy because the, the fulfillment of that prophecy took place within the prophet's lifetime. That's a primary prophecy. All right, a secondary prophecy is something that is further into the future. And so when Daniel is talking about the empire's rise and fall, you know, the Greek empire and then the Roman empire and so on and so forth, that's a secondary fulfillment of prophecy. It's beyond the prophet's lifetime. It's way off into the future. It could be 100 years, 500 years, in Daniel's case, almost 600 years, into the future. That's a secondary prophecy, all right? And then there is such a thing called final fulfillment type prophecies. Those are prophecies that talk about what will happen at the end of the world when Jesus returns, the second coming of Christ, okay? So when Paul in Thessalonians talks about when the Lord comes and with a shout and the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise, that's a final fulfillment 
meaning he's talking about the end of the world. Okay, here's the thing that gets confusing sometimes. Sometimes the same prophecy, okay, the words, the imagery, the same prophecy has a primary and a secondary fulfillment. In other words, it happens in the lifetime and then it repeats itself further down the road. Sometimes a prophecy has a primary fulfillment and a final fulfillment, okay? So let me give you an example. David, uh, David Daniel prophesies that um, uh, 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 the fourth kingdom will be destroyed by the kingdom of God. Remember the stone hitting the statue and so on and so forth. Well that's secondary fulfillment, that's way over in the future, right? But that prophecy also fits the scenario for the end of the world, where God's kingdom will overcome all opposition, even death. Okay? So when we're looking at prophecy, we have, to, we have to first determine, okay, this is the prophecy, is it primary, secondary, is it final? Or is it, can it serve uh, both, uh, both purposes? So the visions and the symbols can be flexible as to when they find their final interpretation. We have to ask ourselves, do they just point to the destruction of Rome and the beginning of the church? Or do they refer to the destruction of Satan's forces and the Antichrist and the second coming of Jesus? Because some of Daniel's prophecies fit either, you know, either slot. Our goal, of course, is to explain the meaning and help the class, of course, understand you know, how, to, uh, how to adapt these. All right, so there's the overview of the chapters with your little chart. Let's go back to chapter seven, shall we? Chapter seven is a continuation of the vision and the prophecy that is found in chapter two, except you know, the, the statue uh, prophecy, or you know, the dream that he had, interpretation of the dream. Now the statue is replaced with imagery of four beasts. The chapter is divided into two sections. Verses one to 15 is the vision itself, and then verses 10 to 28 is the interpretation of the vision. So let's, <coughs> excuse me, let's start reading. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts were coming up from the sea different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking and behold another one like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth, and it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, and, he, uh, uh, and its head were a, a, burning, uh, a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. 
And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. And so let's kind of go through this. The first year of Belshazzar suggests that Daniel is recording something which took place in the past around 555 BC. He begins with a description of the four beasts. First, a lion with wings who loses them and stands on hind legs given a heart of a man. Second, a bear upright favoring one side with three ribs in its mouth and a voice telling it to devour. Third, a leopard with four wings. Let me see if I've got something, no. A leopard with four wings, four heads, and dominion or authority is given to it. And then finally, a terrible beast, strong with iron teeth, destructive, with 10 horns. Three horns are removed for a little horn, which becomes more powerful than the other horns. This other horn has eyes and a mouth that speaks blasphemy. And then, he sees God's throne on blazing wheels. In other words, God is everywhere and judges quickly. Books are opened and the beast is destroyed and the Son of Man appears and is given dominion forever. All right, so there's a summary of the beasts, or excuse me, the vision that he had. So now we'll read the following verses, 16 to 28, and here's the interpretation that he gives. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. Okay, so the four beasts referred to as kings who embody the kingdom that they represent. Now he doesn't give any information about the first three, but he is curious about the fourth beast. The horns represent ten kings, and the little horn that represents three of those ten kings. Uh, not represent, uproots three of those ten kings. Now this little horn will blaspheme against God and wear out the saints for a time, times, and half a time. The saints will eventually conquer and inherit everlasting kingdom. Now the historical setting for this uh, vision is given by Daniel himself within his book. He tells us that the first kingdom is Babylon. So he gives us the clue. It's about four kingdoms. It's about the statue. We go back to the same thing. And he starts from the beginning. The first kingdom is Babylon. We also know that God's kingdom begins during the reign of the fourth kingdom. The middle kingdoms, Medo-Persia and Greece, are explained in chapter eight. So we have historical information about these kingdoms that help us understand his vision. So the vision uh, uh, regarding uh, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's palace 
was adorned with lions with wings. I think I showed you a, a picture of that last time. Archaeologists have found that. Uh, and that fits in with his vision. The plucking of the wings could refer to the madness and the loss of rulership of Nebuchadnezzar for a time. The giving of a human heart to an animal can refer to the point where he was healed after he repented and he began to acknowledge the true God, the human heart given to the animal that he could stand up and now speak represents the healing of Nebuchadnezzar uh, and then acknowledging the true God. All right, the vision concerning Medo-Persia. That image is of a bear favoring one side and that refers to the Medo-Persian Empire where one side of a dual-natured kingdom was stronger than the other because we know from history that Persia eventually overtook the Medes. So one side of that kingdom was stronger than the other. Uh, also, Medo-Persia were much more aggressive and conquered much more territory than the Babylonians did. So there's the idea of the bear and the voice saying devour. They were much more um, they conquered many more nations than the Babylonians. The vision uh, regarding the Greek empire, that was the leopard, remember? Swift and powerful, represents well the, 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 the quickness of uh, Alexander's conquest of the world. Twelve years, in twelve years he had conquered the known, the known world. The four heads refers to the four generals that took over and divided among themselves Alexander's empire after his death. Dominion is given to it confirms the idea that Alexander had complete control. I mean, he truly was a world conqueror during his time. And each kingdom, of course, gets progressive. You know, Babylon was a certain size and then the Medo-Persian Empire was much bigger and, and, and Greece got even bigger. And then we come to the vision regarding Rome. It was the last world empire after Greece. It was the most vicious, most powerful. What it did not conquer and loot, it merely destroyed. That was usually the choice that you had. Give us your gold, here are your taxes which you will pay, or else we'll kill you. <laughs> That's it. We'll burn your city down, we'll salt your fields, we'll cut down the trees, we'll take all the gold that you have and we'll leave you with nothing. Otherwise, begin paying the tax, give us your wealth, and uh, we'll leave you alone. Now the significance of the horns, because there's a lot of talk about the horns. Before Christ, Rome was ruled as a republic. After Julius Caesar, Rome was ruled by, a sing by single emperors, beginning with Augustus, through Domitian, who was the 11th ruler the little horn, remember, 10 horns? The 11th ruler was Domitian, he was the little horn. The three horns displaced to make room for him could refer to what history calls house emperors who were co-conspirators with Domitian who were later killed. Now the eyes and the voice of the little horn suggest that the empire was embodied in this one person, which it was. Daniel says that this horn blasphemes God and historical records show that Domitian actually ordered his subjects to refer to him as Lord and God while he was alive. And so there's the height of blasphemy. And then the vision regarding the kingdom of God. So the next scene we see in Daniel's vision shows the throne of God surrounded by angels that uh, destroys the terrible beast. And although Rome did not fall on Pentecost Sunday when the church was established, the moment the church was established with the gospel, that was the beginning of the end for the Roman Empire. The last gasp came three centuries later, but that was the turning point right there at the beginning of Christianity. Now he mentions you know, time, times, and half time. This refers to an, an indefinite amount of time over which these things will happen. So all these things that he's talked about, 
will happen over an indefinite period of time. A period of time followed by a period of time twice as long, followed by a period of time that will be cut short. Significant of times, times and half time. Again, the imagery, the idea being an amount of time which is unspecified. Unlike Jeremiah's prophecy, he said 70 years. You'll be in captivity for 70 years and then you will come back. And sure enough, 70 years later, they came back. Daniel's vision doesn't give a, a, a specific number of years, just an indefinite amount of time. Now at the moment, we're talking about, you know, we said that Rome was the last great world uh, empire. At the moment, the United States is the strongest world power, but it doesn't really rule the world, does it? I mean, it can't rule the world. Not, not because the UN will stop it or the European unity will stop it or China will stop it. It, it, it is not a world power dominating the entire world because God's word through Daniel says that Rome was the last world power and it was destroyed by the kingdom of God. So we are, we in this country, we are a world power. We may be the strongest world you know, power in the world, but we don't rule the entire world. And, and I don't think it's the, the goal of this nation anyways to, to do that. The beautiful uh, thing about Daniel's prophecy is that Daniel through Daniel, God is saying that Rome is going to be the last world dominating power. And there's great comfort in knowing that because God's word is sure. So Daniel, you know, we, we see the results today of Daniel's prophecies. Rome lays in the dust for the last 1700 <laughs> years. And no matter what you say about the church, or oh, we're having problems, we're not growing as we should, and blah, 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 the church continues, doesn't it? You know, when was the last time you heard about Rome you know, establishing an outpost or a garrison? No, 1700 years. But the church keeps going. It's planting church. You, know, you read in the Chronicle, you know, churches are planted in Africa. Whoops, a new congregation is in Beijing. You know, the church just keeps on going, keeps on planting. Congregations are established, they grow, they may get old, they may die out, others grow in its place. The church just keeps on keeping on. So Daniel doesn't give all the details about this final struggle. The book of Revelation does that. It gives the details. Daniel merely states that the terrible beast, and isn't it interesting that John uses the same term, terrible beast, in the book of Revelation to refer to Rome. Um, Daniel says, will be judged and destroyed by God's throne, His saints, and the appearance of His Son. So Daniel prophesies this thing, the gospel tells the story, the epistles, book of Acts, and so on and so forth, explains the teaching of the church, and the book of Revelation gives a, a kind of a, um, what's the word, a kind of a close-up view of that struggle that takes place at the end between the kingdom of God and the uh, Roman Empire. Okay, so we've got some lessons here that we can, uh, that we can uh, have uh, concerning this. Uh, first lesson, um, Fulfilled prophecy is a sure sign. Fulfilled prophecy is the surest sign of the Bible's inspiration. The only way these things could be seen is if an almighty and internal God revealed it to man and man recorded it. It's the only way this could happen. I mean, we've said it before, We've, we've got trouble figuring out the weather for tomorrow or the next day. You know, we, the weatherman is happy if he gets it right 70% of the time. And that's just a couple of days. Can you imagine a prediction of world powers, I'm sorry, world powers 600 years into the future, exactly, none in reverse, exactly happening? I mean, that can't be done unless God is the agent behind that, that power. So there's no other way to explain this phenomenon. It's beyond coincidence. It's beyond an informed, uh, an informed guess. It's impossible to manipulate. 
The only conclusion is inspiration by an all-knowing and eternal being. And so we believe that the Bible is God's word for many reasons, but especially because it's filled with fulfilled prophecy only available through divine revelation. So when people ask me, you know, why do you believe that the Bible is God's word? There are many reasons for it, but the very first reason that I, I always mentioned is, well, fulfilled prophecy. And not just one, that could be a one-off, that could be a fluke, we're talking hundreds of fulfilled prophecies. We happen to be studying the ones contained in the book of Daniel, but we could study uh, Isaiah, we could, stu you know, we could study a whole number of prophets. And, and the marvelous thing about the Christian religion is that it, it's a historical religion. It's not based on fables that happened you know, 2003. It's not based on fables. These were real people. And uh, the, 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 um, the, hist the, the, the history of the Bible is substantiated by secular uh, researchers. Archaeologists who have no ax to grind, may not even be believers, confirm that, oh yeah, you know, th this city existed and what the Bible says about this particular, you know, Babylon, it was a country and it existed at that time. And yes, there was a person called Isaiah who lived so many years before Christ. And so ours is a religion based in history, not in fable. Very important. So fulfilled prophecy is a sure sign that the scripture, there's something supernatural about the Bible. Uh, another uh, lesson, maybe this, uh, the only one I have to share with you uh, tonight concerning this, is that God's word is sure. If God says that the 11th king of an empire that will only exist 600 years into the future will sin in a certain way and then be destroyed and then his empire replaced and all of it happens, <laughs> I mean, think about that for a second. Not, not the fifth king or the ninth king, the eleventh king of that empire. He says that the, he's going to do this and, and, and this is what's going to happen to him and that's what's going to happen to his empire. Then if God says in a different context, trust me, or he says to me, I will provide for you, or he says, believe in Jesus and you'll be forgiven, or be faithful to the end and you will resurrect to eternal. You, you see the thing I'm saying? If God is able to say, the 11th king will do such and such in 600 years, if he's able to say that and it happens, well then the same God is saying to us, obey me and I will bless you. Trust me and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll provide for you. Uh, remain faithful to Christ and I will resurrect you on the last day. I mean, it's the same God making the same, the same promises. So Jesus is prophesying in a way when He says to us, you know, if, if you are faithful to me to the end, you'll be saved, you'll be resurrected. He's, he's prophesying to the future end of our lives and what will take place with us. And so God's word is sure. It, we, and and the, the beauty of it is he gives us examples of the surety of his word throughout history so that we can have confidence to believe it and to act upon it in, in our day and age. And so God's word is sure because, well, it's God's word, not man's word. And so that's why we study it and know it and obey it and we are assured by what it says. It's a great comfort to know God's word and to be assured of its promises to us. You know? our, our, our parents or our politicians or the people over us make us promises and we tend to believe them, we keep voting for them. <laughs> you know, I don't know why sometimes. <laughs> so I encourage us to, uh, when you see God's promises, then you know, we can be sure of God's promises. Okay, well that's it for uh, Daniel for this week. We'll keep on going with the visions uh, into the next chapters the next time we meet. Thank you for your attention.